To the world, he is Appa, the stubborn, blunt, but well-meaning immigrant dad just trying to make a life in Toronto, running Kim's convenience. But what started as a fringe festival play with Paul Sun Hyung Lee and Jean Yoon in the lead roles, you just have to be nice. I am nice. Quickly became a much bigger deal. That's a rule. That's how they're doing like that. Yeah. Season after season. They're gender neutral. Who? I only see one person. After season. When communities and people see themselves reflected up on the screens, it means they've moved from the margins into the forefront, and it gives them a voice. But it all ended suddenly and under a dark cloud. The co-creators leaving, the production company deciding it couldn't continue, and the cast members feeling blindsided, angry even. It's left the show's fans with one big question. Why quit now? I sat down to chat with Paul Sun Hyung Lee just hours before the last episode aired. I don't even know where to start, to be honest with you, because this must be an, an awfully weird day for you. It, it's been very surreal, right from the get-go, not gonna lie. How, how are you feeling? Um, I'm okay. I think it's, it's funny because I think there are so many mixed emotions and so many things to unpack still. I mean, since it, it's been a few weeks now since the announcement, that the show isn't continuing and it, it's been a process like it, it's, I, and I akin it to grieving a death in the family because you have these waves of emotions that overwhelm you at times and you're upset at how it ended, but then you remember the good times and you want to build on that. And so it, it comes and it goes. As, as time goes on, though, it, it, you know, the pain hurts a little bit less, but there, there are certain moments that just sort of flash you back, like, you know, the final episode airing tonight. It just makes it so final and so real in some ways. And you think you've dealt with it, but obviously there's, there's still a lot of emotion involved. But I, I am looking forward to, to next steps. I'm looking forward to the future. I'm excited about possibilities. And I wanna take all the good from Kim's convenience uh, with me instead of just dwelling on how it ended. Well, you, you talk about likening this to, to mourning a death and you know, some deaths you see coming and some you don't. Did, yeah. did you have any, any inkling at all when you were filming the last episode of the season that it might be the last episode of the series? No. No, not not whatsoever. That that was the hard. That's been the hardest thing, is feeling robbed of the chance of like even if we'd had some inkling maybe to just soak it in a little bit more, or to just appreciate it a little bit more. I mean, we were shooting season five was shot under duress. It was during a pandemic. Everybody was physically separated from each other through PPE, through distance. Um, we weren't able to interact with each other the same way we had been in previous seasons. And not only for the cast, but for the crew and the administrative departments. And so it, it felt very disconnected shooting it, but we were immensely proud that we'd been able to, to pull it off in a sense. And then to get the news that that's it uh, is heartbreaking because you never get a chance. You didn't, we didn't get a chance to say goodbye. And we never got a chance to do our victory lap and to celebrate all these moments and, and to, to have that um, closure in a sense. And so when it's suddenly yanked away from you, it's, it's, it's very jarring and uh, it's hurtful. It hurts. It hurts your heart because you, this is something that was part of my life for five years, 10, if you count the play and for have it to have it end. So unceremoniously um, was painful. Thank you God for everything you give to us for food, for freedom, for business, but most of all, Thank you for family. So what happened, Paul? Uh, like on this decision to cut the series short, I mean, I, I've, so I've heard a few different accounts. I mean, some that the co-creator, Ines Choi, was sort of simply burning out on this. But, but you have also said that, that you tried reaching out to him and, and there was a time where he wasn't even returning your calls, which sort of left a lot of us wondering, so, so what actually was, was happening? Yeah, it's a, I mean, like everything, it, it, it wasn't like a design plan to end the show and there was no mustache twirling villain behind it. It, it was just, it's a complicated situation. I don't want to reach out to Ince and just find out, hey, you know, I didn't want to, didn't want to try to change his mind. He, he made his decision, but I kind of felt that I would have liked to have known uh, or I felt I garnered the trust because after all this time spent together working on this project and championing it and championing him and and everything, I just kind of thought that would have been just for my own sake, I 
I would have loved that, but uh, he wouldn't return my calls. So, so to this day, Paul, do, do you even have a full understanding of why it all kind of fell apart? I, I don't know the whole story. I will be the first to admit that. I know a bunch of it. I know what I know. Um, and that's from my perspective. Again, it's very complicated. You look at it from different perspectives. There's so many different factors um, that come into play with the, the, the cessation of this show. Uh, it, it wasn't an easy decision. I don't envy the producers at all. CBC was a great support. They wanted the show um, very much so. They had greenlit season six. So it wasn't a network decision, um, but it, it's complicated. It's really, really complicated. And at this time right now, it's just, I, I don't see the point of dredging it all up right now. I think it's just, it's too raw. It's too emotional. I think with time comes perspective as well. Uh, cooler heads can prevail. I know I'm still emotional about it. Some of the other cast members are as well. Um, but at the same token, it's like, to what end would that serve it? Uh, I really wanted to sort of turn the page in a sense um, and, and take the good from Kim's Convenience, all the groundbreaking work that we did, all the barriers that we broke through, uh, the representation that we, we showed and, and take that with me instead of how it ended. Uh, now, I think there's a time and a place for that discussion, too, because I think for the industry to grow and evolve and to protect and nurture BIPOC artists behind the camera as well, this is a hard conversation that needs to be had. Uh, that's the only way to grow. And it's not going to be, it shouldn't be about finger pointing or, or you didn't do this or you didn't do that. It, this Kim's was a first show of its kind. And a first show is always going to make mistakes. But for us to grow as an industry, we need to learn from those mistakes without judgment, without people tisk tisking. We're all human beings and we make decisions that maybe weren't the best in the long run, but worked at the time. And so it's, it's all a learning process. And that's my biggest hope of everything that comes out of this, this messy ending for Kim's is that with time and perspective, we can learn from this and grow the industry and, and have so many more shows like Kim's succeed uh, and, and sort of exceed where we went because they've learned the lessons from us. I, I think that's the best case scenario. And that's, this is something that I hold in my heart that I truly, truly want. I mean, I'm hearing what you're saying, but I, I still can't figure out why in my head, like why there wasn't a way for this to continue, right? Private matters are going to stay private. I understand the departure of Innis Choi for, for whatever reason, but it seems like so many of the major players wanted this to keep going. So, so why couldn't it keep going? It's, uh, again, it's, it's a really, it's complicated. And I think when you have human beings in the equation, it gets messy. It gets messy. I mean, I certainly wanted the show to go on. I know a number of the cast wanted the show to go on. Um, this, the network did, but we were running out of time, basically. And to put on uh, a high quality show at the, the caliber that we're used to, uh, we would have needed more, a little bit more time. And, um, you know, it's a big blow when, when the show creator leaves the show, it's, that's a big blow to the show. I mean, there are instances in, in uh, you know, in the industry where showrunners have left the show and they're replaced by other showrunners, but Kim's was so unique because you had an all Asian cast. And if you don't have someone who's Asian, who's part of the producing team, the optics look terrible too. And you, we want that authenticity. We need that authenticity for the show. Action. Fortunately, the industry, the way it is, it's very difficult to find somebody of that caliber to step in and replace someone like Ince Choi. Um, and so it, it's, it's, it's a whole uh, a convoluted mess of, you know, really, and it, I think it really highlights the need to be training and developing and growing BIPOC producers, showrunners, writers, because they need, we need the experience. We need to build up uh, our experience and our craft as well so that we're in a position to succeed instead of just being plucked up and dropped into the deep end and it's sink or swim. That, is, that does a disservice to everyone, I think. And right. so uh, I've always argued that too. We want to set up people to succeed. And it's a lot of work and it doesn't happen overnight, but steps have to be taken. And we did take steps at Kim's, but obviously they weren't enough. So that's, that's a lesson to be learned. I'm not saying that there was no attempt at all, but what we did at the end of the day, we didn't have anybody from within who is qualified enough to step up or so the producers believe. The legacy of Kim's is absolutely 
jaw dropping. You know, I, I, I could I could tell you what I see when I see the show, but but I I, I more want to know what you see when you see not just the show, but when you see a billboard with the Kim's family on it, right? When you see a subway ad, when you see a TV commercial, what do you see? I see my family. I see my peers. I see community of people um, who, who haven't had a voice. It fills me with pride. Um, it's overwhelming. It's over, and it, it just it just accents the fact that okay, everybody sit, sit. this type of representation matters more so, ah. more so than now? ever. The normalization <clears throat> of entire groups of people Who is it gonna pray? Uh, huh? shouldn't be an issue in the 21st it's century. We're all human beings at the end of the day, and this politic of divisiveness, this scapegoating, this blame, this blaming of others, is in my mind heartbreaking and so infuriatingly lazy. Because when you refuse to see a group of people for people as individuals, it's heartbreaking because it's too easy to just throw blame to something else and not put any critical thought into it or really examine why you're upset. And instead, seeing what's going on is permission to act out. I, that's heartbreaking for me. And I think we, we've, we've developed this culture where it's okay to be like that. It's okay to be nasty, to punch down. And what we really need more and more is kindness. Shows like Kim's Convenience we're about family, we're about love, we're about kindness. Um, and so when I see posters of that, I'm filled with immense pride. One of my favorite things of going to CBC uh, is to see that big poster of Kim's Convenience and my big stupid face up there um, <laughs> because it, it, it brings me joy. And I think it brings a level of comfort and joy to a lot of other people. I am so proud of the work that I've done on that show. I'll always, always hold my head up high for that. And there's something that no one can ever take away from me. When I see the show, that is exactly what strikes me every single episode, that this is a family of people that, that looks like you, that looks like me, and they are normal people. They are kind people. They, they are warm people. On the other hand, you know, you mentioned this too. I, I, I think of the pandemic. I think how I see people who look like you and people who look like me getting hurt. And I'm left wondering, like, like, what am I supposed to think here, right? Like, how many steps forward have we taken? How many steps backwards have we taken, you know? Yeah, I, I, it's heartbreaking, again, and it's infuriating, and it's maddening, and it's bewildering. It's shocking. I mean, why? Why? Um, and it, it feels like it's just flaring up again, and it's, I, I think it just goes to show that as, as, forward thinking as we think we've gone, become as a society, there's really a lot more work to do. Um, and I think right now too, with, with mass media, with everybody holding a studio, basically a television studio in their pockets, able to record, transmit, let their thoughts go out there. You can amplify uh, just as much as you can amplify a good thought, you can amplify a negative thought. And we need, as a society, to learn to navigate that, to really be critical in our own thinking. I only have time for one more question. So I got to ask about what's next for Paul Sun Hyung Lee? I mean, like I'm looking behind you. I see stormtroopers. I, <laughs> I, see, I see a lot of really cool stuff that I wish yeah. I could get a, a closer view of. What's next for you? <laughs> well, we'll have you over once the pandemic is over. You know, I've got a lot of things on the go right now. I, I, I can't talk about some of it. Uh, others I, I am able to talk about. Um, I'm leaning into the, the whole geek culture. This is a part of me that I've had carried for so long. And a lot of people are still really surprised about it because they know me as Appa. Uh, and so I love that juxtaposition of being a total nerd, it, literally in my basement with all these geeky collectibles and toys and playing this, this patriarch uh, internationally who's known as being a bit of a hard ass and who doesn't understand this culture at all. So I love that. So I'm leaning into, I've got a YouTube channel called Bitter Asian Dude Inc. And I've got a segment called My Geeky Basement. Uh, in fact, tonight after the episode, I'm doing my first ever live stream and I'm inviting all the fans. And I've got some OG Kimbits fans from the very beginning and they're <laughs> gonna be my guests because I think the fans have made the show. And from the bottom of my heart to all the fans out there who spread the word, who've lived with us, who've let us into their homes, thank you. Uh, and that's the biggest thing, too, I'm going to take away from Kim's is all the wonderful people and fans I've met and the friends that I've made through it. And so that's 
that's what's next is just sort of rediscovering me and, and getting me out there um, and, and just connecting with people. Well, Paul, uh, thank you. And, and, and I don't just mean that for this interview. I, I mean it generally. Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate it.